Good afternoon, everyone. This is Leora Fox. I'm in the national office of HDSA. I'm the manager of research and mission programs, and I'm here with Dr. George Yorling, who's the um, senior director of mission and scientific affairs. And we are very pleased to bring to you another HDSA webinar. Uh, today it's going to be about DNA repair. But before I launch into um, the topic for today and introduce our speakers, I just want to briefly remind you about how to ask questions during this presentation. Um, we're going to answer, we're going to field questions after the presentation, but you can send a question anytime while they're presenting. So you can click on the chat function in your toolbar, which should be at the, the bottom or top or on the side. It should pop up. You can type in your question, hit send, and in the HCSA office we can see your questions and the panelists can see your questions, um, but other attendees cannot. Um, so feel free to ask your questions there and then we will uh, field them at the end. And I also want to remind you that you can view this webinar again. It's going to be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel and our website. I get those up within a few days to a week on our website. Um, you can connect at hcsa.org slash research webinar, or you can go to our YouTube channel, um, which is in that, that little circled red area there. You can click on the YouTube icon, and you can view this recording and any past webinar that we have had. So without further ado, um, I want to introduce today's topic, which is DNA repair. It's been a really hot topic in HD research for several years now, and um, our, our DNA is constantly in use to make all the stuff we need for our cells, and so it kind of constantly needs to be tuned up. It needs to get fixed when it is broken or rusty, so to speak. So there's lots of genes responsible for that, and these DNA repair genes turn out to be especially important for HD, and there's some evidence that if they, they don't work properly, it could cause symptoms to occur earlier, and if they're working really great, it could delay symptoms. So today, Dr. Tamara Mayuri and Dr. Laura Bowie are gonna be talking about uh, DNA repair and HD and telling us about their research in this field. So Dr. Tamara Mayuri did her PhD at the University of Toronto, and she's currently working as a research associate in, in Dr. Ray Truant's group at McMaster University in Canada. And Tamara is investigating the role of the Huntington protein in the process of DNA, DNA repair. And her project is funded by HCSA's Berman Topper Fellowship. She, is, um, she feels strongly about openly sharing her results. She does that with the HD community, with scientists, and also with families for the past several years. And she's also a member of the band Eli and the Straw Man, and they have partnered with the Huntington Society of Canada since 2016 to raise funding and awareness for HD through their music. Dr. Laura Bowie did her undergraduate degree in pathology and toxicology at the University of Western Ontario and began her graduate work at McMaster in 2012. And her project identified new modifiers of the Huntington protein, as well as pathways linking Huntington's disease to other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And she has just completed her PhD in September of 2018, and she's now working as a toxicology consultant, helping to bring drugs from preclinical to clinical trials. And now I'm going to hand it over to Tamara to start our, our webinar off. Great, thank you, Leora. Okay, let's just see what we've got here. Okay, everyone has my screen full screen? Okay, um, thanks yep. a lot. Okay, thanks, Leora. And thank you, George, for having us. Um, we really appreciate the chance to, to talk about our, our research and, and tell our story. So I'm Tam, and Laura's also gonna um, pipe up in a few slides, and she's gonna explain how um, she came to the Truant Lab. Uh, but I always like to, to start these talks with a little family history because like many of you listeners, um, I'm from an HD family too. So here's a few pictures. Um, this one is of my great grandparents um, and they're two of their four kids. They had four kids, one of which was my grandfather. 
my mom's dad. And unfortunately, um, my, my great grandfather had the HD gene and passed it on to all four of his kids. So here you can see a picture. This is me with my great grandma Pearl. Um, at this point, she was 101 and had outlived all four of her children and her husband, having lost them to HD. Um, in the corner of the picture, you can see my mom. And it was a couple years after this was taken that she lost her dad. And after that, you know, HD wasn't really a huge part of our lives. Um, my dad was always involved in fundraising efforts with the Huntington Society of Canada, and still is. Um, but other than that, the only kind of time I heard about Huntington's disease was in school, um, in genetics class. And so I, I was interested in genetics and science, and I pursued that interest and um, did graduate work in cancer research. And at the end of of that training was when we found out that um, my mom had the gene and we weren't expecting that result because um, she was in her early 50s and still not showing any symptoms um, so uh, we thought we had dodged that bullet but we hadn't so at that point I decided um, that I didn't want to work on cancer research anymore I'd much rather work on HD and so that's what brought me to the truant lab at McMaster in um, in Hamilton Canada and that's where I met Laura. So I'll pass it off to Laura. Um, here we go. Great, thanks Tam. All right, so my journey into the world of um, HD research was uh, quite a bit different from Tam's in that um, I had no real personal connection to Huntington's disease um, prior to, to joining the Truant Lab. So my journey sort of began in the fourth year of my undergrad. Um, where I joined a lab that did multiple sclerosis research. And it was at that point that I realized that I very much enjoyed research, which was a bit of a shock for me because up until that point, I had never really considered it. Um, so I took some time off and traveled. And when I got back, I started seeking out labs that did neurodegenerative research because it was a topic that I'd always been very interested in. Um, so I eventually ended up in the Truant Lab where I met all of these wonderful people, including Dr. Tam, who's there front and center. And um, it wasn't really actually until after joining the Truant Lab that I got to know the HD community. And in a strange turn of events, I found um, my own personal connection to Huntington's disease with, when in the um, tiny town that I grew up in of maybe a hundred people and possibly nine streets, um, we found out that my neighbor had actually just been diagnosed with Huntington's disease. Um, Moving back onto the research side of things, in the Truant Lab, our approach to um, HD research is actually based around the, the normal Huntington protein. We want to figure out how normal Huntington functions and what its roles are in the cell so that we can figure out what goes wrong when the protein becomes mutated. Um, Tim is going to give you a quick overview of um, the concepts and terminology um, and sort of what we're going to be talking about in the next little bit. And turning it back over to Tam. Great, thanks, Laura. So, um, yeah, so I'll just kind of give you a brief overview when we're talking about the Huntington gene and the Huntington protein. And so this is kind of the cell bio 101 part of the talk, um, which I admit can be a little dry. So I'll try to make it concise and quick. Um, but without this, we're not really gonna understand what Laura and I are, are gonna tell you about our project. So stick with us. <laughs> so here we just got a cartoon of the cell. Um, our cells are made up of many different compartments, uh, but the one we're gonna talk about the most today is the cell nucleus. Uh, that's where the DNA is stored. And so DNA is what makes up our genes. And genes are the blueprints for proteins. Now, when we talk about proteins, we're talking about the molecular machines that do all of the jobs in the cell. So they're kind of the workhorses of the cell. And how this works is that from the DNA blueprint, a copy is made, it's called RNA. And the RNA leaves the safety and security of the nucleus, goes out into the wide world of the cell. And from that RNA copy, multiple copies of protein are translated off of it. And these proteins come in all different shapes and sizes. So unlike the DNA and the RNA, which are all the same structure, the proteins fold into a very specific shape. 
and the shape is really what dictates its function. So I always like to use this example. This is a, a DNA repair protein, and it's shaped like a ring. It's called PCNA. And this ring protein actually slides along the DNA strand, just looking for damage there. And if it finds any damage in the DNA, um, it basically sends out a signal, recruits other DNA repair proteins that come in and fix uh, whatever damage there is. And they're all going to be shaped differently because they all have a different job to do. So what do we know about the Huntington protein and its shape? Well, it's basically a large glob. <laughs> um, it's a very flexible glob. It can kind of um, squish up and down like a slinky. Um, and its job in the cell is to act as a scaffold. So it interacts with many other proteins and brings them together where they need to do their job. And the thing about the Huntington protein is that it's very versatile. So it can bring one group of proteins together in one place in time to do one job. And then it can, you know, slinky change its shape and interact with a different set of proteins in a different situation. And so it's a very versatile protein but that makes it actually really hard to understand what's going wrong when we have an expanded Huntington protein. Now, when I say expanded Huntington protein, what this comes from is, it comes from an expansion in the Huntington gene. So we all have a number of these CAG repeats in our Huntington gene. And if you inherit a Huntington gene that has too many, like basically 40 or more, that gets translated into an expanded RNA, and that folds up into an expanded Huntington protein. And it's somehow this extra bit of protein changes the shape of the protein of the Huntington protein in such a way that basically in the end it, it kills neurons, it kills our brain cells. And so we still don't know exactly, you know, what happens from point A to point B um, from this change in shape to dead brain cells. But um, Laura's approach in the Truant Lab was to actually try to find ways to make the expanded Huntington protein Im to improve its shape so that it looks more like the normal Huntington protein. And so she's going to tell you about that. We'll switch it back over. Okay. So the um, premise of my project was act is actually um, fairly simple. Um, so scientists have figured out that Huntington adopts different shapes when it is expanded compared to when it's normal and that there are different modifications associated with different forms of this protein. So um, one of these modifications is phosphorylation, um, which we have found is more present on normal Huntington than on expanded Huntington. Um, we also know that by increasing phosphorylation, of expanded Huntington, we can make it, um, we can decrease its toxicity and increase its function and essentially make it seem more like normal Huntington. Um, so my project was to screen hundreds of compounds to find one that increased the phosphorylation of mutant Huntington. And after rounds of failure and optimization, I came across this molecule, n 6 furfural adenine or N6-FFA for short. Um, and we're going to take a break from that right now and come back to it later because at the time when I was trying to figure out uh, what, how exactly N6FFA was working, um, Tam was making some exciting discoveries on a seemingly unrelated topic. Great. So, right. So, as Laura mentioned, um, the Truant Lab looks at, is trying to look at the Huntington protein in its normal state, not the expanded state necessarily. Just trying to understand what the Huntington protein does normally in hopes of understanding, you know, what's going wrong when, when, uh, it's, when it's expanded. And so my project was looking at a, a potential job for Huntington in the cell nucleus where the DNA is stored. We basically had some clues that Huntington was up to something in, in this cellular structure. So um, what we ended up finding is that the Huntington protein actually moves to sites of damaged DNA. Um, and you can test this by actually zapping the DNA within the nucleus with a laser. Uh, so in this experiment, I grew cells up in a dish. The cells were actually from an HD patient from a skin sample. 
And um, I stained the cells with a dye that stains the DNA blue. That way I can look under the microscope, find where the nucleus is, and um, use a laser on the microscope to actually zap um, a discrete region of damage into the DNA. Give the cells about 20 minutes to recover. And then I looked for the Huntington protein and I was honestly quite shocked and very excited to see that the Huntington protein was there. It was lined up on the sites of DNA damage. Um, and I was shocked because at the time it was really kind of a long shot experiment, but it ended up being one of the most exciting things we've ever found. Um, so we found that the Huntington protein was there. We asked, you know, what is it doing there? And basically found that it's doing its normal job. It, it acts as a scaffold in other places in the cell and it acts as a scaffold here too. It interacts with a lot of DNA repair proteins. So at the time, this was very exciting. Um, it, it, like Laura mentioned, you do, there's a lot of failures in optimization. So when you do make a discovery, even if it's something small, um, it's very exciting and it keeps you going. But the question was, is, was this important in HD? Um, like I said, the Huntington protein does like a million things in the cell. So it's hard to know if the one that you find is actually relevant to disease. And so we kind of basically asked the question, so what's the big deal about DNA anyway? Um, and the more we looked, the more we learned that DNA is kind of a big deal. <laughs> so as I explained earlier, and Leora mentioned in the intro, DNA you know, it makes up our genes. These are the blueprints for all of the proteins that we need uh, in the cell. And the proteins are the workhorses. They do all, they carry out all the cells function, but functions, but they don't stick around. They break down over time um, or they get damaged or they get used up or even the cell kind of like um, breaks them down on purpose if we don't need them anymore. But when you need fresh protein, you need blueprints and you need the blueprints to be in good condition or else you can't make the proteins properly. Um, and our DNA kind of gets assaulted all the time with sunlight, with chemicals from the environment, um, and even in our normal processes when our cells burn energy, the byproducts are actually uh, damaging to DNA. And for that reason, we've evolved lots of ways to make sure that the DNA is in good repair. Hundreds of genes are dedicated to um, uh, checking and fixing our DNA. And when things go wrong with those genes, that's when you get disease. So in, so in most cells of the body, uh, most of our cells are like rapidly dividing, right? So in those types of cells, if DNA repair goes unchecked, what can happen is that the cells grow uncontrollably and that's when you get cancer. On the other hand, in neurons and brain cells that aren't dividing and multiplying, um, instead of uncontrolled growth, what happens is the cells recognize that the damage is getting out of control and they just say, shut her down, programmed cell death. We can't keep this much damaged DNA because we're not gonna be able to make our proteins properly. And so um, the, the result is that the cells die and that could be what was happening um, in HD. So these things all made sense and we thought, okay, this could be what's going on in HD. Um, and there were some small clues uh, with HD mouse models and stuff, but then we got a um, And this came in the form of a large genetic study that was looking at why people get sick early in life versus late in life. So we know one thing for sure is that the number of CAG repeats in the Huntington gene makes a big difference. So if people have um, a large number of repeats, they usually get sick earlier in life um, and vice versa. But there's a great degree of variability from person to person. It's, you, you might know somebody who has 42 CAG repeats and they might have got sick in their late 30s. And you might know another person with 42 CAG repeats and they might get sick in their 60s. So the question is, what's the difference between those two people? Um, obviously there could be environmental factors, uh, things happening, but that's not what this study was looking at. This study looked just at what's inside, just at um, all of the other genes in the body and asked what's different between people who get sick early and people who get sick late. And what they found was that a, 
a great number of the genes that uh, were different in these groups of people had to do with DNA repair. So this got us very excited because we had just found that the Huntington protein moves to sites of DNA damage and interacts with DNA repair proteins. Then this study comes out and tells us this is a large scale uh, study with lots of people and it's done with people, not just mice and not just cells in a dish. So we know that we can trust the results. Um, and so our observation that the Huntington protein moves to sites of DNA damage all of a sudden became um, pretty exciting. Um, so if we continue to look at uh, you know, large scale studies that involve real people, um, there's a lot more uh, connection between HD and DNA repair than we ever thought. So one thing is that there are links between DNA repair genes and other neurological disorders. So if people inherit uh, mutations in their DNA repair genes, it often causes a neurological disorder that has you know, some similarities to HD. And then after that initial study that I mentioned, um, more studies have come out which have involved even larger numbers of HD patients. And um, again and again, the same answer is, is coming to light, that DNA repair genes, differences in DNA repair genes are influencing whether people get sick early or late in life. And so, and like I said, it's important that we look at human um, at data from humans, but it's nice to know that when we look back uh, through mouse models and even, even HD patient samples like the skin cells that we use in the Truant Lab um, or blood samples, we're finding the same thing. There's a lot of damage to DNA. And then, you know, it takes us back to this initial observation. The Huntington protein is physically moving to sites of DNA damage. So this could explain why the results of that large um, study, which was that differences in DNA repair genes are influencing whether people get sick early or late. This is one explanation for how this could work. And I'd like to stretch, stress that there are other explanations. Um, there's in particular something called somatic expansion, which is most certainly involved. I'm not gonna explain it now, but if anyone has questions about it, I'd be happy to. But Basically, our working hypothesis in the Truant Lab is that the expanded Huntington protein, well, the normal Huntington protein, we know, goes to sites of DNA damage and has a role, scaffolding proteins there. So if the expanded Huntington protein um, is just not as good as at its job, it could be that these DNA repair genes are acting as genetic modifiers, are modifying the age of um, symptom onset by actually affecting the function of expanded Huntington. So, for example, there's minor differences in these DNA repair genes. In one person, maybe these minor differences mean that this person produces really awesome uh, DNA repair proteins that are super great at their job. And they can help the expanded Huntington protein overcome whatever problem it's having, and that would improve DNA repair. You wouldn't get as much damage built up and then the person wouldn't get sick as early in life. On the other hand, if these small differences in DNA repair genes meant that a person was producing not so hot DNA repair proteins, um, it could be that they would not be able to overcome whatever problem the expanded Huntington pro protein is causing, and you wouldn't have as much repair going on. You'd have accumulation of DNA damage, and then a person would get sick earlier. So this is one idea of how this might be working. Regardless, um, we basically went from our initial little observation of the Huntington protein moving to sites of DNA damage to knowing that this must be important because um, of results from a large scale study in humans. But then we got really excited because Laura's project actually took an unexpected turn, which she alluded to earlier. So she's going to tell you how kind of the puzzle pieces started to fit together um, with that. Okay, so as Tam mentioned, um, 
this is where things started to get kind of cool with my project. Um, so as Tam mentioned earlier, our, our DNA, um, and Leora also mentioned earlier, our, our, our DNA is subject to a, a whole host of insults, either simply due to normal everyday function, or it could be something environmental like UV light. Um, so these insults damage our DNA, and since that this is a fairly common occurrence, resulting in a number of different types of DNA damage, our cells have ways of repairing this damage. And if you remember, around um, this time, I was trying to figure out what in the world NCIS-6-FFA was, was doing in our cells. And um, over the course of my research in the library, rather than the lab, I actually found out that N6-FFA was a product of DNA damage repair. So what does this mean? Like, what does it mean for HD? Well, in HD, as Tam mentioned, um, the Huntington protein is mutated and cannot perform its normal functions. And one of these functions is its role in DNA damage repair. So as a result, DNA damage goes unrepaired, and this leads to eventually cell death. But what happens when we throw N6-FFA into the mix? Well, if you remember the, um, the original purpose of my project, um, N6-FFA leads to increased Huntington phosphorylation, and increased Huntington phosphorylation leads to improved mutant Huntington function, which means that mutant Huntington is now able to do its job repairing DNA um, more efficiently. Um, but that's not all. Oh, as um, this DNA is repaired, more N6-FFA is generated as a result, which leads to um, continued proper Huntington function. At least that's the theory. So the end result is, of course, that DNA damage is repaired, which then promotes cell survival. And of course, when you get to this step in, in research, the next, the next step is to test this compound out in a mouse model of Huntington's disease. And when we gave this, this compound, N6-FFA, to, to mice, they actually got better. Um, so that's, that was the really good news. The, the bad news, unfortunately, was that we also found out that N6-FFA does not make a very good drug. It's not very soluble, and it's rapidly used up in the body, and as a result, not much of it gets to the brain where we need it. But we are now working with an industry partner of Mitokinin, to build a better drug. And um, so this is very much still a work in progress, but it is a great example of how basic research contributes to the drug discovery and development process. I'll turn it back over to Tam now. Thanks, Laura. So let's just talk about kind of where we can go from here. Uh, so Laura mentioned, you know, this, both of these projects are, are a good example of um, how we can go from figuring things out in basic research to um, the point where we can actually get, you know, hopefully <laughs> a drug out of the deal. Um, and that's what we need to keep up. Basically, we now know that we know which direction to go. We, we used to have, you know, a million different ways to, to places to look because the Huntington protein is involved in so many different processes. But we now know that focusing on DNA repair pathways is a good idea. Um, these proteins involved in, in these pathways are, uh, can be considered pre-validated drug targets because we already know that changing them in people means that somebody could put off their disease onset for decades. And so this is where we are aiming our focus. Um, and this is where the Huntington community comes in. So the HDSA is actually funding my current project, which is to look at, so I mentioned that the Huntington protein acts as a scaffold and it, it's interacting with all of these um, DNA repair proteins. Um, and what I'm looking at now is which one of those proteins is more important or can we um, um, modulate it with drugs and try to make things better. And the project is very exciting and it's moving quickly. I mean, quickly in terms of research, which is really slow, um, but it's, it's very exciting. And it's way too early to tell at this point, but if what I'm finding turns out to be real and true, um, then there's a chance that we'll be able to, in the future, maybe repurpose some classes of cancer drugs to use them for HD. So again, 
too, way too early to tell, but I am working on it and I'll keep you posted. Um, that's my little corner of, of the HD research world, but bigger picture, it's really important that we continue to get our information and our ideas from large uh, scale human data. And once again, this is where the HD community has really stepped up. We now have uh, this observational study in Roll HD. Most of you listeners have probably heard of it. If not, um, definitely check it out. It's a huge study, over 16,000 participants being monitored um, for you know everything. <laughs> it, just an insane amount of information about HD patients. This is information that's um, from humans, obviously, and it's just large scale numbers. So we it's a very powerful tool in fact i don't know that there's any other disease that has a tool like this to be able to um, look into you know we we will use it for looking into dna repair pathways but anyone in the hd research community can use this wonderful tool um, in their own way and so i guess uh, i'll just end by saying um, even though the drug discovery process is painfully slow, um, it is really probably the most exciting time that it's ever been in HD research. And many HD researchers really do believe that this is a treatable disease. And um, this slide really gives um, sort of a, a good example of how it's the the whole HD community from individuals participating in studies like Enroll HD and clinical trials to nonprofits to industry and academia. It's everyone really working together that has um, brought all of these new treatment avenues to to fruition. Um, and it very much is a, a very exciting time to be in HD research. And um, if anyone doesn't know, I can switch this slide because it's not working. Oh no. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Do you want me to take over? Yeah, I'm going to let you take over the screen because it's not liking me. Okay. We are here. Right? Okay. Yeah. There we go. All right, so um, as I was about to say, um, for anyone listening who hasn't already heard of it, um, HD Buzz is a great resource um, for keeping up to date on the most recent HD research news. Yeah, and just to uh, along that line, if, if people are interested in staying involved, HD Buzz is great. Um, it really breaks down the um, concepts um, in a sort of easy to digest way. Um, if you are interested in actually um, uh, getting a little bit more detail, there's two blogs, there may be more, but Dr. Rachel Harding spearheaded this idea of um, really uh, sharing every bit of information because she really believes that there's no point in two people on either side of the globe working on the same thing and not communicating with each other. So she started posting all of her results um, and you know some of them are very like uh, super scientific and jargony and everything so it's not for everyone but it is for scientists who want to learn about it and so she posts all of that in a repository called Zenodo and she blogs about it in a more easily digestible way and so I kind of took her lead and I'm doing the same thing on the Ray Truant Lab website so I invite you to check out both of these blogs um, we update them somewhat regularly. <laughs> My last post was a while ago, but there's another one coming. Um, and we just feel that by sharing and getting the information out there, we will accelerate research. Um, and with that, we'll just thank um, our sources of funding, which is so important, um, and the other members of the Truant Lab. It's a great team to work with. We miss you, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> Um, and I'll hand it back over to Liara and George. Thank you so much, Tam and Laura. That was a great explanation of DNA repair in HD. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, and we've got quite a few of them. So the first one um, I will post to you. Someone has asked about um, the importance of, of normal Huntington protein. You really 
um, kind of hammered home the point that you that the truant lab studies the the normal function of this of this protein. And there are some approaches in the in the clinic, including um, Roche's approach, uh, the Ionis Roche trials that are Huntington lowering trials. So uh, someone is curious about your take on um, whether um, Huntington lowering could have uh, certain other implications. Um, because that protein is, is important. Right. Laura, right. did you Laura. want to field this one? Um, sure. Or I'll partially field and you can you can wrap it up. Okay. Um, so there there are there are concerns that um, about about lowering Huntington below a certain level if the protein is is as important as, as we think it is. Um, but this, this mostly means that there needs to be caution going forward with these trials. Um, yeah, I don't know, Tim, if you have something. That's pretty much it. Um, basically, there is, there is evidence to show that you can lower Huntington to a certain degree in mice and the mice are still okay. Um, so basically what we would say is that we have to be really careful about um, how, how far we go. And, the nice thing is that, um, I mean, I hope with all my heart that the, the Roche um, strategy works. Um, but there's also the wave strategy uh, as a backup. And that one is actually only knocking down the expanded form of the Huntington protein. So that would be um, a much safer way to go. Um, but I hope that both of them work. Thank you. We do too. <laughs> and I think that they are they're really spending a lot of time making sure that that is going to be safe. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So um, another question we have was um, basically about N6 FFA um, and what exactly it does or this new um, drug does. Has it been studied in mice? Um, does it help reverse symptoms or prevent uh, further damage? So maybe that's a maybe that's a good question for for Laura. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah. So N6FFA, um, I didn't really get into exactly how it works, but basically, um, um, more specifically, I guess, uh, the, the cell can take um, N6FFA and it makes it into a molecule that's very similar to ATP, which is the cell source of energy. And then the cell can use this ATP-like molecule to phosphorylate Huntington. Um, so that's basically how that process that process works. Um, in terms of of testing, so we have um, tested N6 FFA and mouse models of Huntington's disease, and we have seen improvement of, of symptoms, which is very exciting. Um, at the moment, um, we are, um, or at least Mitokinin, is just getting into the initial stages of of testing how these these new derivative drugs so they're they're similar to n6ffa but they have a few different groups added to make them more soluble for instance and they're just in the process of seeing um, basically how they're they're metabolized by the mice so we haven't even gotten to the stage where they're they're seeing if there's symptom improvement so it's um it's still a bit of a bit of bit of a research that still needs to be to be done on that front Thank you. Um, I guess in that in that vein, um, there are a couple of people asking about um, when these experiments are are done in mice, sort of behavioral experiments and things. Um, uh, are the improvements reversing damage that has re that has occurred, or are they preventing further damage? Um, is there is there any potential for repair of already damaged um, parts of the brain? Okay, so in in the mouse studies, we do see reversal reversal of symptoms. Although I will say um, that this shouldn't be interpreted as it will be able to reverse symptoms existing in humans because humans and mice are are very different. Yeah, we, one thing we do know about most models is that um, you can reverse uh, the disease. So if you um, um, turn on the, the bad Huntington gene in mice and make them sick, and then turn it off, which we can't do in humans, um, 
uh, this, the mice actually do get better. So we know that it is theoretically possible for um, at least mice to, to get better. Um, but it's hard to know what will happen in, in humans. The good thing about the brain is that it's very, um, uh, not versatile, what's the word? It's, it, it knows how to, to get past things. <laughs> so even if some parts of the brain have already been damaged, other parts of the brain can sometimes rewire themselves to go back and do the job of the damaged brain. So we don't, we don't know exactly what's you know, going to happen um, in human brains, but it is theoretically possible that we would be able to reverse uh, symptoms. Thanks to both of you. Um, Tam, you mentioned somatic repeat expansion, and we had um, a couple of comments about that. Um, can you explain a little bit more about what that is and how it has sure. to do with DNA repair? Because that's definitely something that's been yeah. a big topic of interest recently in the recent community. Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually have a couple of slides. Um, if I can bring them back up. I can remember how. Um, let me see here. Do I do? Okay. 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 Share screen. Sorry. <laughs> here we go. Okay. Good. Thank you. So, um, somatic expansion is a really like terrible long name for um, talking about the CAG repeats that um, are expanded in Huntington, in the Huntington gene can sometimes expand more. Um, basically what it is, is if a person inherits 42 CAG repeats in their Huntington gene, they have 42 repeats in every cell in their body. Um, and for most of the cells in the body throughout their whole life, it will always be 42 repeats. But there's something about brain cells, uh, there's something special and also liver um, that um, something happens where the CAG repeats, if they're already past a certain point, like if they're under, you know, 30, then they will never expand. But if they're over a certain um, length in the brain, what happens is the CAG tract tends to get longer and longer. And so in that person who has 42 CAG repeats throughout their whole body, in their brain cells, they might have 80 repeats or 100 repeats. And so what causes what that's going to end up being is of course a protein that's even more expanded and even perhaps more oh no that's known i think that even if it's more expanded it's going to be more deadly to brain cells now the reason that um this is relevant to dna repair is because it's dna repair gone wrong that causes this problem. Um, so DNA repair proteins are working, they, they basically see these repeats and they think it's damaged and they try to fix it and they mess it up and they uh, cause expansion of that um, CAG tract only in the brain cells. So what that means is that in, in some people, if their DNA, if they have differences, so now we're talking about the GWAS study and how people with differences in their DNA repair genes get sick earlier or later in life. So basically if, oh yeah, I do have a slide, good. If somebody has um, one set of DNA repair genes that doesn't really tend to, you know, expand the CAG gene, uh, CAG repeat so much, then that person won't get an expansion in their brain cells, won't get a super huge Huntington protein that's toxic and will live their lives a lot longer before they see symptoms. On the other hand, if someone inherits uh, DNA repair genes that have differences, little changes that make them, um, you know, expand this bit of DNA too much, then they would produce an extra large Huntington protein and um, their brain cells would die faster. That's the idea. Um, it hasn't been um, proven to my knowledge, but it's a, it's a, it's similar in other, there are other diseases that have CAG repeats and it's similar in those diseases too. So it's probably this factor, 
somatic expansion. It's probably the fact that the Huntington protein also goes to sites of DNA damage, and it could be other things too. These are the things that we're really trying to figure out and get down to the, the nitty gritty mechanism. So I'll hand it back to you, uh, Leora. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a good explanation of, of somatic repeat expansions. And um, yeah, we're seeing more and more hypotheses about, about that being quite important. Yes. Um, we have another question about N6FSA, about its route of administration. How, um, how would you dose uh, the mice or potentially a person with, with that kind of drug? Okay, so um, I guess um, it, it, it is hard to say going forward, although um, uh, the route of administration that we, we used to do our initial tests in mouse models was actually by the oral route. Now that may change based on what the best way to get um, as much drug as we can into the brain, or I guess more specifically the appropriate amount of drug into the brain, whether that can be done by oral dosing or not still remains to be seen. Um, so it's, it's not really something that we can say yet. It very much depends on how these, these studies that Mitokinin is conducting really go over the next you know, months, couple of years sort of thing. Cool. Um, in terms of Mitokinin and mitochondria, um, we had a couple questions um, about mitochondria. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, reactive oxygen species and how that contributes to DNA damage. Sure. Um, so this is a this is kind of a, a, a chicken and the egg kind of situation with the the reactive oxygen species, or um, sometimes we call it ROS for short. Um, Okay, so our mitochondria is where our, all of our um, energy is produced. And the byproduct of that uh, is, some of the byproducts are these reactive oxygen species which can damage DNA. And when mitochondria don't do their job properly or if they're you know, um, not too healthy, um, a lot of this ROS uh, can leak out and cause damage throughout the cell, including the nucleus. So, I always thought, you know, um, hunting, like Huntington is at the DNA, it's going to DNA, sites of DNA damage, but I felt the mitochondria must be the source of the problem because it's mitochondria generating ROS, ROS damages the DNA, then Huntington goes to the DNA. So, you know, I felt like we were looking at it backwards. But again, like Laura's um, kind of epiphany, uh, I, I made this discovery in the library and not in the lab. And there's actually a, a quite a big um, uh, field of research that shows that it's actually the nuclear DNA damage that ends up causing the mitochondria to fail. So it's a little bit involved, but basically when you have DNA damage, you get activation of a, of a protein called PARP. And it uh, generates these chains of molecules called poly ADP ribose or PAR. And it generates these chains of PAR all around the damaged DNA. And that's the signal to tell DNA repair proteins, okay, here's the damage, get in here, you, you need to uh, sit down and get to work. And so the PAR um, is the, the kind of a scaffold that uh, brings everything together. But the problem is to generate that PAR, PARP protein needs to use up uh, this thing called NAD+, which is a precursor for ATP. <laughs> oh God, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. Basically, when, the, when PARP sees DNA damage and starts generating these PAR chains, it drains the cell's energy. And that ends up causing problems with the mitochondria. And then there's a couple of other ways too, that basically this PAR generation sucks the life out of the cell. It really does a lot of damage and um, ends up being quite toxic to the mitochondria. Then the mitochondria release their ROS and you get this terrible cycle. Um, and so um, what a lot of um, fields are starting to find, and especially in Parkinson's and also in ALS, is that if they uh, block that PARP, uh, activity at the beginning, 
they can restore function of the mitochondria and then um, in you know the mouse models or whatever they're they're testing tend to get better and that's what we think might be happening in hd also but these are very early times and there <laughs> we've only done a few experiments so far so we have a lot of work to do before we really understand so i hope that answers the question <laughs> yeah i think you 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 um You've also written a bit more about PAR on your on your blog, or will continue to do so. I know you've yeah. got some re recent publications about that. So yes, um, so if I can just try to, do to it. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> just really because I know the question was like, um, does the ROS generated by the mitochondria go to the nucleus? Was that the question? Um, that that was one of the questions. Yes, it was more about um, yeah whether, yeah, what reactive oxygen species do, and there was a question about it going into the nucleus. Okay, so um, I, I hope I answered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I think that we're getting, we're getting towards the time to wrap up, so I wanna, I wanna thank you both very much again for your time today and for talking about your work, and thanks to everybody for all your, your questions and your your attendance today. Um, we had a couple questions about um, seeing this again, so there will be uh, links to uh, on our website and on YouTube on HCSA's channel uh, to view this webinar again, so you can share that and watch it um, anytime you like. Um, and you want to? Do you have anything to add, George? No, today? Thank you all. Thank you, Tam. Thank you, Laura, for. Uh putting this really nice presentation together for the community and, and thank you everybody for participating. We hope to see you on the next research webinar. Yes, and there will be announcements about that coming up. So thanks everybody and have thank a great you. day. Thank you very much for having us and, and thanks for everyone for listening. Bye guys. Hi. Okay, bye.